Hi, everybody. Thanks for having me. Uh, this is now the second time I've been to RCAF, and uh, last year we supplied the, the, the beef to this organization. I just want to thank everybody. I'm, I'm humbled to be here and to speak about our really tiny plant that's trying to make a tiny difference in, in what we're doing as far as protein processing. Uh, Janet and I uh, own the meat plant. We've gone through a lot of struggles in, in trying to um, move protein forward, whether it be uh, uh, beef or pork, and now we're into lamb and, and sheep product, uh, getting to hopefully some bison at some point. But I just want to thank everybody for uh, having us again, and hope you're enjoying the beef that you're, that you're eating. Um, you know, thank you. A lot of the men and women at, at Wall Meats uh, put a lot of effort into everything they do, uh, 12 to 18 hours sometimes, uh, to make sure that we put the, the best product forward we can. Uh, again, we're a tiny business, and we're trying to make a little bit of a difference. Um, I've been, I'm a retired Air Force. I did 30 years in, the, um, in my service to my country and been all over the world and seen different protein from every uh, corner of the world. And, and I think that, to me, in the South Dakota beef is, is, is the best beef I've seen in my 59 years of being alive. So I, um, I hope you can see that uh, in, our, in our product. And I'm sure other places are good. I'm, I'm not just saying it, but for here uh, and now, uh, I'm sharing it with Michigan. I'm sharing it with Wisconsin. Uh, Arizona's called in. Uh, there's folks in California reaching out to us. Uh, of course, it's always you know, an inspection requirement to get some of these products through. And uh, we recently opened a store in, in Rapid City. Uh, it's a, a cutting facility. It's a retail store. It's also the Western Dakota Tech Lab for cutting. And I'll, I'll talk about that in a minute. Sorry, Jim. Um, I'm almost done. Uh, and that's just really, it's an effort to continue to teach people how to pr process protein. I'm about to retire in about three, four years. What do I do? I teach the next, next generation, entice them to uh, continue to put this product that you have in front of you in front of somebody else. Because uh, it's a good product and it's a, uh, you know, in my 30 years and 13 years of deployment, this is the best country in the world. Yeah. So what do you do for that country? You serve it again. My 30 years is, is, is done with the Air Force and Department of Defense. Now my next service is to you and my ag uh, partners. So I'm going to turn it over to Jim to introduce himself, and I'm open for questions. Okay. Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. I'd certainly like to thank uh, RCAF for giving me the opportunity to come here and, and share our uh, story about what we've done in the beef industry. Uh, as a young man growing up, I grew up on a farm uh, in a town called Greenwood, Missouri, just south of Kansas City. My dad was, a, <clears throat> excuse me, an auctioneer. He sold a lot of cattle sales across the country, and he always had me and, and uh, the young kids setting up the panels and driving the steel post and building the pens for the for the sales. So at that point there, you know, I learned the love of livestock and truly appreciated what we get out of them. So as years went on, the Kansas City Stockyards closed. After I got out of college, I joined my dad in the auction business and we built a, a livestock market, Mocan Livestock. But first of all, I'm gonna introduce you to my family. I wish I had a cordless. So this, this is, uh, she's gonna get right here, this will work. Check one, two, yeah, this works better. So this is, this is my wife and, and myself. Uh, my wife is with me, Kathy Herzog. I don't know how many years we've been married. Long time. Close to 40, I can tell you that. 
<laughs> I'm going to be in trouble when I get home. But anyway, I've got uh, four great kids, uh, four uh, outstanding son-in-laws and daughter-in-laws, and 13 great uh, 13 grandchildren. So we're we're very very blessed there. And uh, my two sons, they work with me. Right here is a picture of myself, my father, and Todd is is one with the paddle in his hand. <clears throat> Todd used to sort all the cattle at the market, and now he's running the packing plant. It's a big change for him, but he took the bull by the horns. Brian runs the grow yard, and he order buys a lot of cattle. So here I'll just give you a brief story about Mocan. We built it in 1992. We've got a really nice facility with five acres of covered pens. We can handle a lot of cattle. We sell about 60 to 65,000 cattle a year through our market. And at that point, you know, we could see that, uh, you know, the, the, the cow-calf guy was always getting less money for his calves. And when the fats, you know, were, were cheap and boxed beef was high, it was really aggravating to us. So we have a drive through uh, facility there you, and back up, unload. Have a nice arena. We can seat about uh, 225 people in our arena in there. We have an outstanding staff. I don't care what you do. If you surround yourself with good people, you're going to be successful. And, you know, I always tried to hire someone smarter than what I am, and I've been pretty fortunate with that. <coughs> Both of my uh, daughter-in-laws are really sharp. We specialize in, in uh, a Mocan back wean program for our customers. Uh, if, if they'll do everything under our protocol, we guarantee a sale time at 1 o'clock every week. If, if you've got 10 head or if you've got 160 or 200, whatever. And we have many buyers that are sale. But I will say this, what I've seen in the, in the past oh, five, six years, the, the cattlemen that are buying cattle to background on the farm and then maybe go to the feedlot and feed them, that number has dwindled dramatically. We've got more corporate buyers uh, that sit in our barn and control the market, you know, and, uh, which is good. You know, when, when corporate steps in, they jump it up. But when they're out, they're out. And the thing about corporate, when they're in, the, the regular guy the backgrounder, he can't afford to buy that calf because he doesn't have a sweetheart deal on the other end with the packer. So it really makes it tough. And, and you all know as well as I do, they got sweetheart deals. So here, that's just, we, we send out uh, a weekly market report uh, via text. We're members of LMA, uh, then when my sons got out of college, first thing they wanted to do is, is own cattle and buy cattle and help the market, support the market. So we built a grow yard, which is just right across the road uh, from the livestock market. And there we can keep about 800 head there and then <clears throat> scattered around on two or three different farms. We background 12 or 1,500 head and then we've got probably uh, out of that 12 or 1,500 about 300 on feed for fat cattle. So again, it set, this particular piece of property here, it, it sets on uh, 56 acres, and it's just right across the road from the sale barn. We raise all of our own feeds and, and uh, buy local uh, silage from our corn. We can make silage from local farmers. The only thing that we feed our fat cattle, we feed silage, distillers, and ground hay. And I can show you some of our cuts on our beef that we're killing at our plant, and they're absolutely phenomenal. You know, the, the marbling, a lot of them would grade prime. So they do qualify as, as, as grass-fed. So, you know, here comes COVID. My boys, you know, whenever they built the grow yard, they start selling a few fats along and... and uh, COVID comes along, and then they couldn't get their cattle. We couldn't get them processed. We did get them processed. You didn't get back what you wanted. So that was kind of our, our motivation behind the, the plant. Uh, we, we purchased the property a year ago in June. 
and uh, in July we started started on the facility, and it was just a uh, piece of property that joined our grow yard. It belonged to MFA, a uh, local co-op there, and I tried to buy it for 15 years from them. Well, th they never would sell it to me, and I went to them, told them I want to put in a, a beef processing plant there. They were they were in favor of it 100%. So there's what the building looked like, and there's what it looks like today. It was a red iron building. We completely uh, tore all the metal off of it. You can see the inside there. There's some more inside pictures of it. It was quite a project to undertake, I can promise you. We we subbed it all out. We'd done it all ourselves. You know, there wasn't anywhere you could go and and buy a set of plans. There was absolutely no place. So we started touring around. We went to different facilities, and the first place we went to was West Texas A&M down uh, Amarillo, Texas, and toured their facility down there, and it was state-of-the-art. I mean, he had an open checkbook, and, you know, it was like $12 million dollars in this little bitty uh, facility down there. But it, believe me, it was nice. But one thing we took away from there was our hot box. He told us if we didn't do anything else, take any of his other ideas, he said, uh, put in a hot box. So, you know, we've got a really good process of going through and handling the cattle on our kill floor here. You know, that's our unload. We, can, we have a drive through or a pot unload. This is the harvest floor. If you notice up high there in the ceiling, our harvest floor, we even have it cooled. The sooner you can start cooling the carcass down, we keep it at, at uh, 45 degrees in there. Actually, every room in the plant that the, our employees are working in is at 45 degrees. But, but we've done all this and designed all this ourselves, and it was quite a project. This is our hot box. So the day that we harvest cattle, they go into the hot box and they hang there for 24 hours. And it sucks the heat out of them, except for deep down in on the hips. And we get them down to like 40 degrees. And then we move them into our hanging cooler. And we can hang about 150 head in there. And then we hang them for 10 to 14 days. Some cattle we will just hang until they're cooled and they want them cutting out of there. But 90, 95% of our cattle will hang in there uh, 10 to 14 days. In our, our dry aging cooler, as well as our cut floor, we put windows in there. So when people come in, we've got a big open foyer. People come in, we can give them a tour. We can show them, you know, there's your beef. It's hanging right there in the cooler. This is our cut floor. So on our cut floor, you know, we decided to go with 16-foot high ceilings. It's 18-foot high in the, in the kill floor, 16-foot high in here. It helps a lot on the, on the condensation. Uh, it's real easy to clean, and it's a really good work environment. So our packaging side of it, uh, we've got a roll stock machine. We don't hand wrap anything. We, we either cry back it or, or run it through our, our roll stock. And we call that, uh, I don't think there's a picture of it. You can kind of see it up high. We call that our Lamborghini because it costs about as much as one. So this is our, our retail front. And we, we put in a really nice retail front. We sell about one beef a day out of there. Uh, we haven't advertised on the radio or you know, Facebook, of course, but 80% of our business is repeat customers coming back. They just rave over it. 20% of our business comes from new customers coming in daily. And we don't have any stuffed potatoes or anything like that. We sell strictly our beef that's raised on our farm and we, that we purchase at the livestock market. And we've got really good response from from the local community. And, you know, we really, really, truly need more of these plants around the country. There's, there's what the facility looks like when you pull up to it. It turned out pretty good. Our, our architect and engineer that we hired out of uh, Nixon, Missouri, he done a, a really good job taking this old building and, and designing it, the outside of it, 
we, we designed the inside of it. So there's some more pictures. We're all USDA inspected. We've got two inspectors on site every day. Uh, all of our help takes pride in everything they do in there. Because, you know, it's really, I like the sale barn business, uh, dealing with the customers, and some of them's easier to deal with than others, but it's really nice when you can sell someone a really good steak, worth the money, and they come back and just rave about it and want to buy more of it. I mean, you know, our tenderloins or fillets are nineteen ninety nine a pound, and I don't know what they are everywhere else, but I'm sure they're a lot higher than that. But we raise our beef, and actually what we're selling are fillets and our strips and our ribeyes, skirt steak, everything all figures back. We, we're figure, our cattle are figuring back to about a buck forty two fat, and you know producer and, and we're making money, really good money on that. And but the producers, you know, you sell your fat steer for a buck twenty, the packers are making a pile of money. We bought some cattle the other day from a, a local gentleman who feeds out cattle. And he's always sent them out west, and and he's a good friend of ours and owns a feed store there. So we just we bought them. He said it works better for him. He can bring us a handful of fats, and, and we can kill them. Then he can fatten the other ones up, get them a little bigger, whatever. But anyway, from the time we bought them cattle, it's been two weeks ago. We're going to cut them next week. They went up in value probably $450 a head. And still, the cattle haven't went up that much for the, for the producer. You know, between the packers running up the box beef... And, of course, it's not traded. They, they control it. They didn't want it traded, you know, like the, uh, the board. And don't think for a minute they don't control that board 100% on the, on the grain and on the cattle side. I guarantee you they do. Because <coughs> we, <laughs> and I'm going to tell you a little story. We traded, uh, it's been about two years ago. We had a lot of cattle come in. My boys had raised them. And it was in May. And the May feeder cattle board very seldom moves. Well, uh, Brian, he likes to, he trades the board a little bit, and, and he had a few positions on the feeder board. But anyway, we had a, we had 1,100 head of these steers that we sold in our market. Well, that week it had rained in uh, Oklahoma, so they didn't have any inputs from down there. And, and some reason in the north, we didn't have many inputs in there. But but when we sold our cattle, I mean they were the true right kind of yearlings like you guys grow up here and they grow in Nebraska. Well, they came out of Nebraska and the coat is where they came from. <clears throat> but anyway, we moved the feeder cattle board to buck 40. And I had more life-threatening email and threats from Chicago, you know, that than a guy should ever get. Should never got one. But someone was playing the board and he was on the wrong side of it, you know, and thought he had it all figured out, but he didn't. But uh, so they, they kind of quit bothering me. That's been two years ago, but I'm sure I cost them a lot of money. Didn't bother me a bit. So we have a truck. We can uh, deliver to different places. This is the basic layout of our plan. And uh, uh, Todd's, Todd, my son, that runs the plan, he'd be more than happy to work with anyone. He's got his hands full. We, we do have our plans. We'd be more than happy to sell them to you. I can tell you our plans cost us about sixty-five dollars to $70,000. And, you know, I'd, I'd be more than happy to sell them to anybody in here for a, a price. You can talk to me about it. And just anything we can do to get more of these plants up and running. Like I said, my son runs the plant. He is, uh, he, he's done an outstanding job. But whenever we started... He really didn't know, and I didn't know, and my other son, Brian, who takes care of the backgrounding yard, none of us really knew who was going to do what. And then Todd took the bull by the horns, and he can literally tell you everything there is to know about uh, running a, a plant. I'm totally impressed. He can tell you every beef cut. He can take one apart, you know, like, like he's been doing it for 30 years. So I'm blessed to have a, a great family behind me and supporting me and, and also our community that's behind us 100%. And if I can help anybody build another plant to compete against the, 
the four major packers, I, I'm all for it. I mean, I'd like to see four or 500 of them built, you know, around the country. We've turned down a tremendous amount of work. We can do, we can, real comfortable, we can slaughter 15 head a day and cut and package 15 head a day in our plant. And, uh, ten, and, and we employ 18 people today, uh, full time, pay them really good. You know, we have uh, five, well, out of the 18, we have five Hispanics that we brought in uh, that are really good. We wanted to start, we wanted to hit the ground running. So we had some good meat cutters come in. And then there's a local boy, old Lee, and he runs the saw. And he is really good, very fortunate to get him. He worked in another plant south of us that had closed uh, some time ago, and he'd ran a, the, the bandsaw for 22 or three years. So we're really lucky to have him. There's where your flow is, breaking them off the rail and getting them down the line. And the sooner you can get them off the rail and broke down, the sooner they can get them cut up. So with that said, you know, I'm, I'm really uh, pleased, you know, Everything that we've done, we built the market because there was a need. We built the grow yard because there was a need. And we built the, the uh, packing plant because there, there was a need for a, a processing plant as well. So you can visit us on Facebook, uh, Herzog Miko, uh, read about us there, and uh, enjoy American beef. I will say that uh, here next, the 31st, we are going to get our product put in it's going into uh, two high V stores in, in Lee Summit. And we couldn't get in the meat counter. We got, we're going in fresh, uh, packaged. I think Tyson's got the meat counters all sewed up. But we are very pleased and very excited to be able to go into the high V store uh, with grass fed and with all natural beef that uh, we raise there on our farm. So we're really looking forward to that. But like I said, there's a big need for it because Todd turns down uh, two or three pot loads every week for a niche market somewhere. And if you guys build a plant, they will come. Yes, ma'am. Well, we do do that, and we started out doing that, and we booked full really quick up to, like, uh, this month. And then, you know, right out the gate, Todd can see he wanted to start dialing that back as quick as he could. We don't do quarters anymore. We're not really excited about doing a half because it just slows everything down. When you're, when you're paying your employees 25 or $30 an hour, you want to keep the ball rolling. Oh, the wait time right now, uh, like, well, we're dialed back, though. But if you called and really begged Todd, he could probably get you one in next week. Our budget has been 2023. Yeah, you, you need to build a plant. Yeah, you really do. There, there needs to be more of these around the country, I promise you. And, that, you know, we can... Make the Packers set up and pay attention. I, you know, at, at the end of the year, we'll kill 2,500 that, that the Packers will not get, which that's not a big number, but if you had 500 of these around, they'll know you're in town. I have, I have a couple questions for um, Ken and Jim here. I know that labor, let's talk about labor. That's a challenge. You, you need a a skilled labor force, even in this small end. Talk to us about how you train your labor and how you attract quality labor. Well, what we do, we offer a 401k and uh, we furnish all their insurance, all health insurance. So that's mm -hmm. furnished 100%. Like I said, our, our five Hispanics that we have, are, they were meat cutters before we got them, but it was totally different. You know, we're breaking them off of a rail and they were doing something different where they were so we had to work through that process and kind of retrain them so firing up was really slow getting everybody trained except for the gentleman on the salt everybody else that works in there had no idea about anything about packaging or running the machines or anything we trained them all 
Ken, I know that you're really passionate about training more um, individuals to come into this. So talk to us about what your goals are here locally with training. Thanks. Can you hear me? Yeah. Uh, our, my goal is really uh, for 30 years in the Air Force, we train, train, train. Right? As a new meat cutter, as a teenager in high school, you handed a knife and said, okay, follow me and cut this. Okay, I don't want to cut it wrong. So my, as I get older and grew up uh, and start cutting again, we have to figure out how to build that new generation. So I partnered up with Western Dakota Tech, and we're going to start a meat cutting course for two reasons. One, academically, I didn't know how to cut meat. So we're going to fix that. And then when you get to the, the store, you'll practically know how to cut meat. So in 11 months, I've raised that person from what would have taken us 10 years to teach in just 11 months. Now, not that, that's not going to say that he's going to be the, my perfect cutter, but he'll be learned enough that I can leave him alone and say, here's a loin. I want it to look like this, and why? So academically, uh, he's taught, and then practically, we teach him how to cut the way we do. You know, we're doing a lot of uh, innovations nowadays. Uh, there's new technology out there. It's not just a knife and a handsaw. There's a lot of technology out there that we need to teach our people to give, become more efficient and be better at their craft. And oh, by the way, Jim, you know, that's a great thing that you're doing in 401k, but we also need to keep our employees with better wages to keep them around. To have a career is not anymore. You don't need to go four years and then learn how to do what you need to do in four years. You do it as you go, and you also pedigreed or certified or diploma after you're done with us. So you can go to Safeway, you can go to Jim and say, here's my learning uh, credentials, uh, I'm, I'm, test me. And that's what we'll do along the way is we're, we'll do some upgrade training and then some progression training and then test. Here's, here's that loin, I want you to cut it and I want to see how you, you, you do it and you pass that portion of that, that learning curve that we need to straighten out. You know, the barrel curve tells us a lot. You gotta have to straighten that, that incline of training, like we do in the Air Force, which I kind of modeled after. So when you get to a certain point, you're a master mechanic. Now you're gonna be a master butcher. So we're gonna follow that train and then do some progression ladders along the way. I would like to mention we did send uh, two of our, our young men that work for us to Kentucky to their class meat cutting class down there. And which was all, it was good, but they didn't learn near enough for what it cost in the short amount of period of time they were there. So that's one thing that, you know, we can also offer is you come to our facility, we'll help train your guys. You know, there's not a better place to learn than there is on a cut floor, you know, instead of in a meat lab. I mean, it's totally different. It's totally different. My, <laughs> Todd, there was this lady that showed up there at the plant. It's been about a month ago now. And, she said, I understand you hire on the spot. And he said, absolutely, follow me. And he said, you're going to get gowned up. And Todd took off for the employee break room and turned around when she was gone. <laughs> He'd scared her. So the next day, he had no idea who she was or where she went. So the next day, this young man shows up there, and he had his lunchbox with him. And he said, I understand you hire on the spot. And he said, absolutely, I do. He said, come on. So, and that's been him over a month ago. And now both of them work there. Excellent. And have been there full time. We pay them really good, you know, and uh, they're doing really well. Well, I think Jim has believed, believe, or breathed belief into us to go home and start plants. Ken, uh, talk to the to our audience about um, working with their processor and selling direct because I know you work with a lot of cattle producers, hog producers in this area, and you are that connector in, in taking them selling direct to the consumer. Talk to us about that. I am. Uh, thank you. I, I, what I've done, this started about two year, three years ago now, and, it wouldn't, and I'll get into the new plan here shortly. I, I don't have enough time in a day to, to explain all that, but uh, the direct marketing for us, you know, it goes beyond cool. We take that producer and their product and put their name on that package on the subprimal. So let's say Wall Meats, meat producer, somebody, Janet Niehaus. 
Uh, and that creates that, that direct marketing for my producers that I work with. So when they, if they like that beef, they'll say, hey, let's go get more of Janet Niehaus's beef. And then they call us, and then we connect them, or we connect them directly to that producer. So the custom not for sale market increases. Our producer gets to sell their beef. On the flip side of that is my retail and inspected product has their, has their product in it. So if it's good and it's or our working relationship with that certain producer or a bunch of producers becomes a marketable product, that retail side just starts to increase as well. And we've seen that in the last two years, is if you honestly combine with your producers who work so hard for what they do and you market their product, they'll come back to you. So the three-way street of direct marketing is not just me as a retailer, but me and my producer as a direct seller to our consumers. You know, we had a list of 18 folks on the list, and we call that list, and it clears right away. So we build another 18, and we clear that through our producers. So if that's what you're asking, yeah, we do a lot of that. I do a lot of custom. I do one day of custom slaughter, two days of inspected retail. So I provide my, cons my producers an opportunity to direct market themselves. I know it takes a lot of time, but I owe it to my producers to do that for their customers. And they continue to come back. You know, and even there's somebody in the room, they couldn't sell their beef, right? So I got on the phone and said, hey, you're on the list to cut to get some beef, but I have a producer that does not have customers. You need to call this producer and talk to them. Because in the custom not for sale, I'm not supposed to sell their beef. So I send my customers that are always calling. I have another list of 10 people just yesterday. So I, I connect those with the producers that have beef that haven't sold. I don't necessarily have to sell them there for them. They sell themselves. So Excellent. I hope that helps. Yeah, it does. Um, any other final thoughts, you guys, before we wrap up? Well, my final thought would be, you know, you hear a lot of things whenever we started, oh, the USDA is going to be hard to get along with, and it's difficult to build a plant, and it, it, it's not, and they're not hard to get along with. I mean, like I said, we've got two inspectors there. They're really good guys. They see something wrong. I mean, we got to fix it, That's, and I want them there, and for that reason. The, the granite inspection was probably the most difficult hurdle to jump because they really don't help you point out what you need to do and, and fill out on your paperwork. But, you know, we've been there, we've done that. We didn't know anything about what we were doing and we jumped in with both feet and feel very confident and very excited and very proud of what we've done for the, the cattle industry and looking forward to working, you know, for several producers for many, many years and, uh, you know, again, if we can help anybody in any way, we're ready to help. Thank you all. Thanks, Jim. I may have to call you about uh, <laughs> building new meat. Like, I, we are actually in work in do, uh, building a 20,000 square feet uh, meat plant. And with the, with the learning center located on in the, between the ready to eat side and the raw side, and again, I'm, I'm pushing that learning curve. It, I don't, it's my recruiting ground, but it's also inducing other meat plant entrepreneurs to build their own plant at some point. They just need to learn how. Janet's uh, uh, my business partner, and she's going to teach the other side of this, the sales and marketing and um, accounting. I'm going to teach the raw processing and uh, ready to eat because there's there's value added to that ready to eat side of this processing business we're doing so I'm going to teach that too so that they can profit um, the profit margin on, on the ready to eat side is is huge if you really think about it and uh, some of those critters you know I everybody wants fats good I want fats too but there's nowhere for coal cows to go to well I'm going to explore that market I already have by the way my my effort to do Beef to school. They're delivering today to Burke. And I'm, oh, I'm watching my... Burke, South Dakota. Burke, South Dakota, who, which started Beef to School when we did. We happened to be a few weeks ahead of them. 
and they were processing in another state. Now they've come back home to do it at Walt Meats. So we have up to 12 schools now. And that ready to eat or co-cow market, we can use that and add some value to that. Cool cows are good. What do you do with them? Well, sell them to me. I'll buy them. I'll use them. I'll make, I'll make some magic. You know, when we first started this business, Jen and I went to a restaurant because we kept knocking on doors. Oh, no, we're good with commodities. Oh, no, we're not going to do that. Well, we started it, and it exploded. I had people out the door in my restaurant waiting to have that local beef product, and now they're hooked. We call them the meat roadies. You know, last year when the pandemic hit, we took our truck into, into Rapid City. You could see vehicles following us. It's like, oh, my God, they're after us. <laughs> Somebody get in between and stop them. And we had football fields, long, long lines of people wanting your beef. Your beef. I'm just the cutter. It's what you produce that they taste. I'm just a middleman. I... I'm, I want to be as humble as I can, but that's honest. I'm just here to move your product with you, you know, as a, as a direct sales or without you as my retail. Either way, it's going to work. We're, we're, you know, we're building that 20,000 square feet uh, meat plant. We have a 2,400 square feet that's doing what should be a 10,000 square feet plant. We're working hard. We've got a lot of labor. People come in. They think it's easy work. It's not. It's not at all. So I've probably cycled 90 people through my meat plant because they thought it was easy, right? Well, I want to stop them. I want to train them. I want them to stay. Had I done the training or there was training available to, to, while they're in the meat plant, I could have kept them. Well, if the, if the environment was was bigger, it would help, right? It would, uh, if there was, this is the cutting table, for example, half of the cutting table, so it's twice as much, but I'm cutting five beef on this one, these two tables. That's way too small. They're all like this, cutting. So what do I do? Build a bigger meat plant. Build a cutting store in Rapid City, which is helping a lot. It takes the pressure off a wall. No longer are they doing all five on this table. There's two here and three in Rapid which helps our, our phase plan. Phase two is our, our 20,000 square feet. So we attacked, we attacked. We provided uh, beef to school product with coke cows or hamburger cows and meals on wheels. So those two immune system, um, you know, uh, one's trying to build one, one's declining. If we can test those products and provide our our elderly some good product and our young people with some good product. Everything in the middle is bonus. The restaurants I provide meat to, this kind of setting I provide to, the hospital I provide meat to, all those move your product, right? And, I, and yeah, okay, so some people just aren't cutters. Some people are cookers. Some people are just laborers. I wanna know that when I start teaching you Okay, you can't cut meat. Let me take you over here and package. <laughs> this is probably where you need to be. We got smarter at that, right? We can do fat to protein content. So when it goes out the door, you know what you're getting, which is what people come in and say, hey, I need 90-10. Come on this way. This is it. 85-20. What do you need 85-20 for? I need burgers that are going to flame up. Well, here's the product right here for you, right? So we do all that. So we teach our consumers what they're getting. Excellent. We build confidence and competence into our consumers. That is South Dakota beef. You'll taste the difference between that and whatever you get at the other store. And they come back. They come back because they learn. Anyways, I'm sorry I could Perfect. run all day. I didn't bring a slideshow because I've been doing that for the last eight, nine months. And it's been two or three hours, right, Lance? And it's a learning curve for all of us, but there's a lot I'm trying to promote our beef through, whether it be schools, whether it be state institution, whether it be hospitals, whether it be just your consumer. I got one, uh, I'm selling bones now. Believe it or not, I'm selling bone marrow. 
I never would have thought that two years ago. But there's folks out there, not just in the restaurant setting, but in the bar setting. They want you to cook marrow, to drink through a bone. Okay, as long as you buy it. Yep, there you go, right. there you go. I'd just like to add one more thing. On our facility at our livestock market, we've got a, a really nice restaurant in there, and, and uh, he brought it to my attention. I failed to mention it, but we it, it would only been open one day a week for 29 years, and in our town of Butler, 6,000 people, our, the biggest restaurant in town closed because of help. You know, Neil couldn't find any help, so he just shut it down. He'd ran it for 35 years, and he was done. So I leased our restaurant to one of the waiters that worked down there, and me and my wife have got acquainted with a real nice guy. I leased it to her for a dollar a month. She had to sell all of our beef through there. And uh, now I'd say she serves 75 or at least 75 people a day every day, and she's open just two nights uh, during the week, but other than that, open six days a week. So people just rave about what we produce and what you all produce. But, you know, I don't know where the, where the breakdown is. I guess maybe in the wet aging process and, and the way that it's handled, the time it gets to its final destination, and, you know, or, or what are we eating? Are we eating beef from Mexico or Brazil or Argentina? We don't know because of the labeling. But they know when they come to our place, they can look out, you know, behind the plant and they can see where the cattle come from. And then we also harvest cattle for probably 10 other people that have their own USDA label. And they're kind of difficult to get, it takes a little bit of time, but uh, we label their product for them as well and Excellent. you know, help them promote their product too. 